welcome to the Peter King Podcast, a pre-final weekend of the NFL season podcast, and so much to get into with my good friend Miles Simmons, uh, my partner on the pod from NBC Sports. We are going to be joined a little bit later on by Joe Flacco, the incredible story of a quarterback for Miles Simmons's Cleveland Browns. And uh, we've got a lot otherwise to get into. We're going to talk about the Lions fiasco and whether it's all Brad Allen's fault or if the Detroit Lions bear some responsibility for the debacle in Dallas on Saturday night. Eagles in crisis. Miami Buffalo, who you got? And then we're going to get into part two of the pod after we hear from Joe Flacco. How tough are the Browns right now with Flacco? Kind of locked in to that number five seed. Looks like there's an advantageous matchup in the first round of the playoffs, no matter who they play in the AFC South, because that'll be their their first round game. They've beaten them all this year. The Cleveland Browns are 4-0 against the South. So that's going to be interesting. Baltimore with the number one seed. We will debate which team in the AFC is going to be their toughest foe on the way to the Super Bowl. And we'll do the same thing with San Francisco in the NFC. And then finally, what do you do if you're Ryan Poles right now with Justin Fields? Do you keep Justin Fields and build around him? Or do you take one of these treasure trove of college quarterbacks and Miles Simmons I don't watch much college football, but that Michael Penix is one of these players. Man, he is he is making up a lot of ground on the backstretch. And here he comes firing for the lead at the quarter pole. So we'll see. But hey, it was fun watching Alabama and what or I'm sorry, Michigan beat Alabama, Washington beat Texas. So now a Harbaugh Penix uh, and uh, NCAA championship game shades of Michigan, Indiana from whatever it was three or four years ago. So that'll be a very interesting matchup next Monday night in Houston, but miles welcome. And I have not, we have not spoken about it and I'm just very curious. I want to hear your take about the lions Cowboys fiasco at the end of the Saturday night game and basically who's at fault here well it it certainly seems to me that Brad Allen and his crew is at fault and you know part of the reason I think this is because of the precedent that that crew is set for making bad calls or not making the correct calls if you want to call it that in big situations I mean there's a reason why it was leaked a few weeks ago that Allen's crew is under heavy scrutiny for some of the calls that were not made and some of the decisions that were not made. But those things were judgment calls. This here appears to be a procedural error. And that to me is a bigger deal. If you have the Lions who we know because they run this kind of stuff all the time, they're very detailed in the way they do things, right? So they understood at least in some way, right, that they needed to go up to the referee and say and declare who is eligible and who is not in terms of those linemen. And they were trying to be deceptive on that play. And I agree with everybody who's saying that, you know, when you do that and you are trying to be deceptive, then sometimes things may get uh, confused and caught in the crossfire. But I think, you know, if we're just going to say, oh, well, they're deceptive, so they played that game and this is the prize they win, like, Everything is deceptive on a football field, is it not? I mean, play action is deceptive. Now, that's in the in, in the course of a play and not something that is procedural, but I just feel like, man, if you understand what it is that you need to do to be successful and you think you've done it, and then it turns out that because of a procedural error on the referee, right, that that is not what happens, then I can understand every single level of frustration. But the other thing is the Lions have to move on, right? Because this does not matter anymore. 
You know, you can maybe look at it from the NFL standpoint and say, okay, well, we need to maybe increase the scrutiny on this crew. Maybe this is something where we don't have them doing high leverage playoff games, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're the Lions, it's over. It's done. We move on. We move forward because there are still things that you need to accomplish this season. And reflecting back on whatever that was, whatever happened there is not really going to help you. Yeah, that's true. And I'm sure that Dan Campbell will impress upon his team those exact things. But the bottom line is the Lions don't have an important game on Sunday. So against the Minnesota Vikings. So it's not really all that significant to get your team to get over it today. You know, we're talking about they better be over it by a week from uh, whatever it is. My gut feeling is if they play the Rams, it'll be the Saturday night game, but who knows? Um, it, it, who knows when it'll be? But in wild card weekend, that's when they next have to be ready. I think they're, there's about 94 things I'd like to say about this, but I want to preface it. And I want to start by saying that in my opinion, the, uh, the, the major <clears throat> fault here lies with Brad Allen, the referee. You know, he was too rushed to try to tell the crowd and then the Dallas Cowboys that number 70 was reporting as eligible even though there's no indication that number 70 pitchers said anything to him. And we don't know exactly what happened. All we know is that Brad Allen said, 70 said it, pitcher. And number 68, Decker, said that he said it. You know, obviously Taylor Decker, the left tackle, who the Lions clearly wanted to be eligible. But this was a clear attempt by the Lions to try to confuse the Dallas Cowboys and by sending three guys to the referee, which, you know, Kalen Kaler in The Athletic wrote a really good story as we report or record this on Tuesday. And Kalen Kaler said, this is a borderline, very, very borderline uh, penalty because if you attempt to do this, while substituting, if you have too many men on the field or too many men in a huddle so that the other side of the field cannot tell exactly what you're going to do, that's a flag. So this is essentially the same thing. It hasn't been written out of the rules yet, but it is the same thing. You are attempting to try to convince the other team that you're going to have somebody be the eligible receiver or or eligible, uh, you know, the eligible eligible. guy to, yeah, lineman eligible, excuse me. And when in reality, you want them to think that it's going to be somebody who you have no intention of throwing the ball to. And Miles, let's make this clear, okay, that to say that the Detroit Lions and clearly the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell even said it at his press conference on Monday. They were hoping that the Lions would, that the Cowboys would be confused on this and they wouldn't cover Taylor Decker coming out. And obviously when the ref says number 70 is eligible, nobody's covering Taylor Decker because he is at that moment an ineligible receiver. So the Cowboys never even thought to cover Taylor Decker. Why would they? He's not eligible to go out for a pass. So when everybody is saying, oh, you know, they cost the Lions this. I mean, the bottom line is, yeah, Brad Allen was at fault here. But by all this subterfuge, the Lions ended up throwing a wrench into this so that when Brad Allen said number 70 is eligible, Dallas clearly was not going to cover number 68. And then number 68, Taylor Decker goes out uncovered. And it wasn't until the ball is floating toward him that the Cowboys sprint toward him to try to get him to miss it, but they were too late. So, you know, 
for all these people who say, oh, the poor lions. Oh, they, you know, they, the poor lions just got screwed here. Let's just remember one thing. If Brad Allen had gotten it right and said number 68 is reporting, then the Dallas Cowboys would have covered and accounted for number 68. And then would Jared Goff have even thrown him the ball? I have my sincere doubts about that. So look, as I said at the beginning, Brad Allen deserves the uh, majority of responsibility for blowing this play, but he's not alone. I don't know. Anything I said that you disagree with or want to come back at me? Well, I, I would say that you're right, that he's not alone in bearing the responsibility. But again, I think it's a procedural error, and that's the thing that makes it the most frustrating because officials miss judgment calls all the time, and that that's that's something that happens. It's human nature. But I think if it's a human error in that moment especially, that is a huge, huge problem. And so, yeah, look, I, we don't know, though, if the Cowboys would have covered Decker because just because they announced that, I mean, he's still, the way that formation was, he was lined up as the left tackle because he was one uh, over from the center, basically, right? So you got center guard and then Decker. And right. in that moment, you know, if you look at the formation, you're not thinking usually, I mean, maybe you are, maybe you're not, but you may or may not think, I guess is my point here, oh, if he's eligible, that means I still need to cover him even though he looks like he's just lined up in his normal alignment. Right. And basically right. he is, but also he's not. So there's a lot that then goes into that. And it makes you think a little bit more if you are the Dallas Cowboys, because especially if you get up to the line quickly and you snap it, there's not that much time to then realize, oh, wait, he already reported as eligible. And even though he looks like he's just lined up as a left tackle, that means I need to cover him, especially because the receiver lined up to the outside of him is back. So that means that he's uncovered, which makes him more eligible. So like, there's a lot of things that go into that and make it that detailed, which is why I understand Detroit's high level of frustration because they practiced it that way. Right. I mean, it looked like on the replays that they showed on ESPN that Jared Goff gets the play into his helmet or Ben Johnson probably tells him, Hey, we're going to run that. Right. So then Goff, you see him tell Taylor Decker, Hey man, go report and pull him out of the huddle to go do that. So that's why, like I, like I said, I understand Detroit's level of frustration. I think it's bad that it's a procedural error, but at the same time, yes, d if you're going to be deceptive in this way or try to confuse people, there is a chance that you may end up confusing the official, and that is just really unfortunate. So Mike Florio reported on Monday that the NFL doesn't plan to do anything doesn't plan to change the procedure or uh, how players report or anything like that. This is horse crap by the NFL. Total, absolute horse crap. You want to know why? Because the NFL shouldn't be about people sneaking around and trying to pull hidden ball tricks. This, this shouldn't, that is not what competition should be. Competition should be, okay, fair is fair. And you know what fair is in this case? One player reports to the referee. One, not three. One player reports to the ref. And that player goes like this. I'm eligible. I am eligible on this play. Okay. And the fact that the NFL clearly is okay with three players going up to a referee and trying to confuse him with the play clock running on a play is, I don't want to say it's borderline outrageous. It's outrageous that they have a simple fix and won't fix it. And for all the things that are wrong with officiating in the NFL, that's just a little symptom. The symptom is that 24 hours after this play that everybody is talking about even more than the games on the penultimate regular season weekend of the season. The NFL could have come out and said, listen, we're going to adjust this in the offseason. Don't worry. But no, the NFL says, whoa, 
There's nothing wrong with our procedures. Yes, there is. You blew a game because of the procedures. Fix it. It's simple. All right. That's the end of that. Um, let's oh, great. move on to something that will get my blood pressure down a little bit. Well, <laughs> if I lived in Philadelphia or if I was an Eagles season ticket holder, now it would be time to get my blood pressure way, way up. And that is, what is wrong with the Philadelphia Eagles? And Miles, I watched, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment, but that was the one game I had on my TV. I actually was watching two on Sunday. I usually just watch Red Zone, but I was watching the Dolphins uh, and, and Ravens, and then I had on the Eagles game as well. I was just sort of fascinated with, you know, can the Eagles turn it around? Can they get their mojo back, what, you know, and all that? And clearly they couldn't. But in watching a lot of that game, what really struck me is what a paper mache defense they've got. I don't care if Sean Desai is calling the plays. I don't care if Matt Patricia call, call the plays. That defense stinks. They've played two of, the t two of the worst five offenses in football over the last two weeks at home. And they have allowed 51 points in the second half alone to the Giants and to the Cardinals. And I, as I wrote in my column, I don't think this is fixable. I think the Eagles are going to get bounced out of the playoffs and soon, probably in the first game, who knows? There looks like they'll play the NFC South, so who knows? But right now, Tampa versus Philly in Tampa, give me Tampa. I, I, I don't, who can Philadelphia beat right now? Are they going to beat the Giants in the Meadowlands Sunday? Probably, but based on recent performance, I, going one one and four, you know, in December, I I would be dubious about them. What do you see now when you see the Eagles? Well, I I see a team that is certainly in crisis, and there's reasons for that, offensively and defensively. Offensively, you've got guys like AJ Brown who are clearly frustrated, and, you know, and not talking to the media, and then it's this and it's that, and now we get the reports. Oh my gosh, he's frustrated. There's a disconnect between him and the coaches. I mean, you had Jalen Hurts after the Seattle game talking about commitment and all these different things, and oh, what is the, and you know, kind of getting frustrated at a reporter, but really he's not frustrated with the reporter. He's frustrated at apparently himself and the team and all the things that are kind of going wrong right now. And I agree with you though, with the defense, that's problem number one, because, and you cited this in your column, Peter, the third down numbers are abysmal right now with the Philadelphia Eagles. And especially if you think about what Tampa Bay can do and how good Baker Mayfield has been throughout the season on third down, that is strength versus weakness. And that to me is one of the biggest reasons yes. why the Buccaneers should maybe beat the Philadelphia Eagles if those teams play as the four or five matchup. Like I, I find it really interesting and a little bit confusing as to why the Eagles are so bad on third down, because look, we know that they have talented people up front, but apparently the back end is really where a lot of the problems are. Um, so yeah, like you said, it doesn't really matter if it is Matt, Patricia, Sean, decide that team has just been really, really bad on third down this year and when you can't get off the field and you don't allow your offense to get those to get more possessions right to get more plays to get further established in a rhythm well you're going to continue to lose games and it's kind of funny i mean we're saying all this about a team that yeah they're going to the playoffs you know they are last year's nfc champions so there's a reason to believe that they can get themselves right in some way but we're running out of time. It's almost the same thing you say about the Chiefs and their receivers, right? At this point, you just kind of are who you are. So how do you play around that? I don't know. I mean, I, if you're Philadelphia, that's the biggest thing to me. Third down defense. If you can't get off the field, you're not going to win playoff games. You know, Miles, I it, so much of what you said right there, I, I mean, there's about five things I, I want to respond to, but... The biggest thing is right now, when you look at the Philadelphia Eagles, so many things have to be fixed. Um, and I don't know how you take Darius Slay and James Bradbury 
and make them significantly better between now and Sunday at the Meadowlands and then in in the playoffs. And and again, look, I think the Eagles have some very good players on that team, but I just don't think that the manifold reasons for their downfall can be fixed before they play their per- first playoff game, you know, in a week and a half. Let's let's just look at one other thing before we uh before we go to our break and listen to Joe Flacco. I think there's rarely a game that I think the NFL probably could have picked this game uh late last week for game 272, the last game of the season. But it was clear once Baltimore was track shoeing the uh, Miami Dolphins on Sunday that it was going to be basically an AFC East championship game uh, in Miami on Sunday of week week 18. So clearly that was going to be the game that the NFL chose for Sunday night. And Miles, I think the big headline of this game is not only because I think sometimes we look at history a little bit too much. It's not only that Buffalo is 8-1 and one in the last nine against Miami, but I think the bigger thing is that right now when you look at these two teams, you look at a pass rush in Miami that I don't know how they're going to affect Josh Allen well enough. I mean, this is going to be a huge job for Vic Fangio. Both Jalen Phillips with his Achilles and now Bradley Chubb with his ACL, they're two best pass rushers. You know, six weeks ago, this was a dangerous defensive team because Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb really made it that way. And right now, they don't have either one. I, I, I And again, look, anything's possible. But I think it's going to be very difficult for Miami to win this game. Even though it's a home game, they'll have the crowd on their side. I don't know what the weather's going to be. But obviously, if it's a hot day, a sunny day, that could have an impact too. But how do you look at it, Miles? Well, I think it's not just those guys, but then Zavian Howard's dealing with a foot injury. That is something that's very yeah. significant to their secondary. Then you also have on the other side, is Jalen Waddle going to be available? Because if he's not available, then that really does take away from Miami's offensive attack. So, yeah, it, it's going to be difficult for Miami. I mean, it, it just is. But, I mean, I think if anybody needs a bounce back game, it's them. Right. You have to be able to do more. You have to be able to show more. And it's really interesting. You know, you go up to Baltimore and you just get, you know, the mess kicked out of you. How do you respond? You know, what are you going to do when your back is against the wall? Because, I mean, as coaches, players talk about this all the time. Nobody cares. You're still going to play the game. So it's going to be a depleted Miami team that still has extraordinarily talented players. Right. Jalen Ramsey is top three at his position in the NFL. Right. You know, Tyreek Hill, top three at his position in the NFL. So it's not like there's no talent going on. And it's not like the Buffalo Bills have not been also decimated by injuries. It is a game of attrition, but I, it is when you've got one team that's just been white hot and then the other team that continues to deal with injuries and, you know, just got, like I said, the crap kicked out of them. It makes it a little bit different. And the other thing, too, is. If Miami doesn't win this game, they're still going to be in the postseason. Will they host a playoff game initially? No. Right. But they'll still be there. There's a chance that Buffalo will be out entirely if the Steelers win. And I think it's if the Jaguars (laughs) win, right? Then if Buffalo loses, they're done. So this is a playoff game for them. And it's not necessarily one for Miami. We'll see how Mike McDaniel approaches that. It's going to be an interesting game for sure. But yeah, at this point, I'm picking Buffalo. The re, you know, the reason why I think it's a big game for Mike McDaniel and why he has to play it like the seventh game of the World Series is that if you look at the way the standings go right now with the Browns locked in at number five, mm-hmm. just Miles, think about this. Okay, think about <clears throat> what it looks like 
for your road ahead. And I know that, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say I know, but I'm pretty sure that Mike McDaniel is not going to be thinking, well, this is definitely going to happen or that is definitely going to happen. But, you know, let's just talk about a couple of possibilities and probabilities, really. If Miami is the sixth seed, okay, they are probably going to have to play a Saturday or Sunday or Monday night game in the wild card at Kansas City. So a frigid night game in the wild card round. If they survive that, which they could, because obviously Kansas City is not Kansas City anymore. But if they survive that, then they most likely, most likely would have to go to Baltimore in the divisional round. Okay? And if they survive that, then likely slash possibly, you know, figure out they're either going to go to Cleveland or Buffalo for the championship game. Right. So if you're Mike McDaniel, you have to look at this game like, okay, what would you rather have? Would you rather have the second seed and, uh, and, and have uh, Indianapolis or Pittsburgh or whatever come to your place, you know, or would you rather have the other? And and I mm -hmm. I that's the biggest reason why if you're Mike McDaniel you got to play this game like it's the seventh game of the World Series. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And you know it's interesting because one of the things that you know when you add that seventh playoff team that I kind of didn't like is that the top two seeds no longer get buys. Right, it's just the one. But if you have home game and then another home game as the two seed. Right. That makes a huge difference. It really does. You're not traveling anywhere yes. in those first two weeks. You know, everybody's coming to you and you get the creature comforts of being at home. And I feel like if you're Miami, especially this time of year, you get people coming into hot weather that are just not used to it, no matter who yes. it is like that. That is an important factor. And, you know, if you are the Dolphins at this point, too. What do you want to do but keep the Bills out of there? You don't want to see those dudes again because you don't want to have to see Josh Allen hot in the postseason. You don't. So I agree. Like, you you got to play this as if there's no tomorrow because it makes a significant difference, I think, if you are the two seed versus being the six and you have those two home games in, in the playoffs, even if you don't have the first round bye. It's, just, it's a significant difference. Miles, um, we are going to take a break right now, but what we're going to do on the other side of the break is you're going to hear from Joe Flacco. I talked to him the morning after uh, Cleveland trashed the Jets and had that memorable scene in Cleveland, you know, in, in which Joe Flacco is getting his name chanted after, I'm sure, for a decade getting the crap booed out of him every time he ever walked into Cleveland, if for no other reason than he was a Raven. Uh, yeah. But it's so interesting now to see Joe Flacco's career renaissance. We're going to hear from Joe Flacco right after this. So, Joe, what's so interesting about your life and your career is that here you are almost 39 years old and you're playing, you might think differently, but I think back now to the year that you guys had sort of the magic run to the Super Bowl, including that overtime game in Denver and all of that stuff. And I wonder for people who don't really understand how you've been able to come in and sort of hit the ground running right now, what would you say? Oh, man. Uh, listen, I think when, you, when you've when you been able to, to be thrown into a bunch of different situations and play in a 
bunch of different types of football games, you know, where all kinds of different things are needed to win the game. Once you get thrown back out there and you're with the guys in the huddle and you're on the field, you, you kind of get thrown right back into it, man. And, and you feel like you've been there forever. So I think I've obviously been, you know, awarded um, that luxury of just having that experience. So when I do take the field, no matter what's happened during the week and, and and how prepared I am because I just got here a week ago, you you can trick yourself into thinking, okay, I'm ready to go. I've been here before. Um, I think that's a big part of it. You know, my first memory of you is at training camp with the Ravens in 2008 when I think anyway, uh, the defense led by Ray Lewis was really trying to maybe not intimidate you, but was trying to see whether – you were you had the stuff to step in and be the quarterback right away. And I have this distinct memory of, I think you were at Westminster that year. Yeah. D- distinct memory of Ray Lewis standing right across the line from you, probably four feet away from you and just screaming and just calling out all these things and yelling and sounding just like Ray Lewis. And you just stood there for a minute and you stared across the line. And I remember I wrote, it was like Flacco was saying to Lewis, are you done? And as soon as he finished, you called your play and you went on. But I, and I said something to Lewis after practice. I said, I I told him that story. And I said, it looked like he wasn't going to be intimidated. He goes, no. And he said, we really like that about him so far. So you recall much about that and your sort of trial by fire early in Baltimore? Yeah, here's what I know about that locker room. Is there was a bunch of grown men in that locker room, man, that had their heads on straight and they knew how to, you know, they knew how to approach football, whether it was practice, games, off seasons. Um, they were just, you know, there's you weren't going to survive if you went into that locker room and didn't know how to, you know, handle yourself. So that was definitely important for me. It always is important to me. I mean, even coming here in Cleveland right now, like you want to become a part of a locker room and there's certain ways to do that. And you got to hold your head up high and and be able to react to anything and, and look at, you know, look right down the barrel and handle it. So like I said, there was a bunch of men in that locker room. So if you weren't going to be able to be that type of personality, um, then you would, you would have got, you know, you would have got exposed pretty quickly. Um, and that's what I love about those guys, man. Uh, some of the best teammates I've ever had just love playing football and some of the toughest guys you'll ever see. But you've never been the type of holler guy like that. You just, no. yeah, you're more of, you're more of lead by example type. Yeah. It's not about the hollering. I mean, even with Ray Lewis, I mean, you know, Ray's great at doing that stuff and getting people pumped up and, and giving the speeches and all that. But that's not what makes Ray Lewis Ray Lewis. I mean, what makes him is he shows up every single day. And when he has a chance to make a tackle, he makes that tackle. And when he has a chance to change the game, he does it. And, you know, it, 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 you know, I, I think some of those things, you know, obviously people – People with Ray, I mean, they know both parts. They know how good he is on the field, and they know how good he was off the field. Um, that was just his personality. Um, and you don't have to be just like that. Like I said, you just have to be able to hold your own and prove that, you know, you can be tough and you can come through in those situations. Joe, let's fast forward of only 15 years to what happened this past off season to you. I talked to Joe Linta, your agent and friend, and – And he kept telling me that the thing that really surprised us is not necessarily, you know, people aren't going to give Joe a starting job right now. They're not going to hand that to him, but that they wouldn't even work him out. And that's the thing that really bothered Joe. And I wondered, as the fall went on this year and your phone simply wasn't ringing, were you bemused, shocked, surprised? What were you? Listen, I, I I think you get to see a lot when you've been around the league. I mean, you've covered the league for a really long time. And, you know, I've been in it a you know, fair share myself at this point. Uh, you've seen a lot of things. And there's different reasons for things. I mean, um, you know, I wasn't necessarily shocked. I mean, part of me, you know, was for sure. But ultimately, I think you can probably find a reason for maybe why things didn't happen. 
Uh, and, and Joe was probably more worked up about it than I was just because <laughs> that, just because that's his job. I mean, my job was to stay focused on what I was doing and stay in shape and make sure that I was ready if something happened. So I was able to kind of compartmentalize it enough to not think about all that stuff. I was able to kind of stay in my lane and, you know, just take it day by day. And I think that was important just for, you know, myself mentally, um, cause it, obviously it proved to have, I proved to have gotten a call. And if I had a different, I think if I had a different, you know, focus throughout the last, the, the, the first few months of the fall, I don't know if I would have reacted the same when I got here. I don't know if I would have been in the right mental, you know, mindset to kind of like, to kind of take advantage of the opportunity. So I think the fact that I was able to stay positive and just take it day by day, it definitely allowed me to like make the most of the opportunity. What was your mental mindset as the fall droned on? Listen, I would, like I said, I kind of extended my off season and just kind of kept doing my work. And listen, of, of course, some doubt creeps in as to whether I've played my last football game or not, um, especially as the season moves on and on and on and on. Um, but listen, at the same time, there's nothing I can necessarily do about that. And I'm not going to sit at home and cry about it. I'm going to just do my work and you know, have a little bit of faith that something might happen. Can you tell me what an average day for you was in September and October, an average weekday with, you've, yeah. got, five, you, you've got five kids, right? Yeah. So like I, I wake up, get in the cold tub, cook some eggs up for the kids, get ready, for, get, get dressed to go work out. My four oldest kids walk to school. My youngest in kindergarten, um, I drive him, I drive him to school and I drop him off anywhere from 7.50 to 8.05. And then whether I was working out at 8.30 or 9.30, I kind of head right over to the gym or I come home for a half hour and then head over to the gym. And then my day's over about 11.30 noon, you know? And then, you know, I took it, dude, listen, so, some days I took advantage of it. Me and my wife went out and had lunch. Other days I called my brother up and we went out to the pickleball courts, played pickleball for two hours. Um, you know, but I, I was in the gym and, and, and throwing two, sometimes three days a week. And other than that, I was, in, I, was in, I was, you know, trying to keep my head on right and enjoy time with my family. And then my kids got home at 3.30 and they biked around the neighborhood and got up all their friends. And I played, I played quarterback in the front yard for an hour, three times a week. Um, you know, and then from five o'clock on, we ate dinner and drove the kids to a million different things. So, you know, pretty typical uh, for most dads probably around the country. Yeah. Or, you know, at, at, at least if they had the day off, I guess, you know. Do, do you think that have you figured out at all what the next iteration of Joe Flacco is? I mean, <laughs> do, you, do you have any idea what it is you want to do with your life? No, no. I mean, listen, yeah. I, 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 I know what I enjoy doing. I mean, in terms of, in terms of a profession, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, the NFL is such a special uh, thing just because I already, I, I mean, this year is a little different because I'm, I'm away from the family a little bit, but even while you're playing in this league, you get such a good amount of time to spend with your family. You don't travel that much you don't do all those things. So it's not like, I'm, it's not like when I'm done playing, I'm going to be like, Oh, I'm going to spend all this time with my family. You know, I, I already do that. And, and yeah. it's already, it's already a lot of fun and I'm, I'm sure it'll become more fun. And when they start getting into sports and stuff like that in high school, it, it's going to be that much more fun. But, you know, as far as what I want to do, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to focus on what I'm doing right now. Um, I remember Steve Ashadi talked to us uh, when I, I might've been a rookie. And he was just I, one of the things I remember him saying was just like how important it is it is to stay in the moment and focus on what you're focus and focus on what you're doing right now. And of course, you can have other things come along and other opportunities and make the most of those. But it's really important to you know kind of make the most of what I'm doing right now. I mean, this is the most important thing besides my family that I have in my life, and it has been for such a long time. And to be able to share that with them at this point, um, that's all I'm really worried about. Do you get a lot when you walk into the locker room where you treat it all like the old man or how, how was it when you first got into the Browns locker room? 
I think at this point, it's not, it's, it's kind of easy. The fact that I'm a little bit older, it makes it a little bit easier to walk into a locker room, you know, because these guys have some kind of view as to who you are and what you're like, just because like, you know, they saw from afar or wherever that, you know, from a time that a lot of these guys were probably, you know, in elementary school. So it, it's a unique experience to kind of be able to feel like that old guy in a locker room. And because guys just kind of naturally look at you in a little bit of a different way. Um, but at the same time, it's been unbelievable how some of the guys have just kind of welcomed me in. You, you, you still have those feelings. I don't care how many different locker rooms you've been in. You want to come in and you want to have an impact and you want to become a part of the team and you want guys to, you know, you want guys to, to make you feel like you're a part of the team. So um, the guys have been just, just great. I want to ask you a little bit about football and about how you've played so far. You know, obviously, you know this, that the Browns have been one of the storied franchises in the NFL, born on, born uh, by Paul Brown in 1946. And in all of that time, that they've never had a player who's thrown for 300 yards four games in a row. And you walk in and you do it. And that's why I think people really wonder about how much help you've had from your coach, from Kevin Stefanski, from Alex Van Pelt, your coordinator, from the guys on this team. What do you think when you look at what's allowed you to come in and it be so seamless on this transition to your new team? Man, it, it's it's everything. I mean, everybody likes to make a big deal, but we always talk about this, like how everybody just makes a big deal about quarterback. And it is, it is important, right? But I, I try to like, I, I, I think I've kind of come up with a decent way to describe it. Like, imagine you're out there and you're on a Wednesday and you're playing scout team quarterback and you could bring whoever you want to play scout team quarterback on a Wednesday. When the defense has everything covered, you're not going to do that great of a job in terms of completion percentage and, and touchdowns thrown and all that, because the, you know, they're all over everything, you know, playing quarterback has so much to do with the play caller, the offensive line, the running backs, the wide receivers, all doing their job and getting open. I mean, I threw a corner route to Elijah Moore last last night for a touchdown. I mean, imagine if he doesn't get open there. Then it's just another incomplete pass. I mean, you know, all my job was to do was to hit him at once he got open, and Kevin called the play. I mean, obviously, you have to be able to do that in in, in the moment and just play football and, and and make and make the most of those opportunities when they come up, but. I mean, this position is reliant on everybody. And I think that's gotten away from, uh, I think the fact that this is like the ultimate team sport has kind of gotten away from us to a certain extent. Everything, everything wants, everybody wants everything to come down to one guy, uh, you know, or two right. guys. And it's yeah. just, it's just not the case, man. That's why this sport is so special. That's why winning a game in this, at this level is so special because those guys in that locker room, we all know it. It's, it's about everybody, and it literally takes everybody. I look at the job the coaches have done this year, Kevin, Alex. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. Look how many guys that have been injured on our roster, and these guys continue. Um, Jim Schwartz. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Like Everybody has just stepped up and, and, and come through in the clutch. Is and and your chemistry early on with Amari Cooper, David Njoku, Elijah Moore. What do you think of when you think of why you have been able to sort of form a good bond with those guys so quickly? I think the offensive line has done a great job, so it's awarded me like room in the pocket and and chance to look down the field. We've gotten a good amount of chunk plays, whether that's getting the ball in Dave's hands five yards down the field and letting him do the rest, whether that's Elijah and Amari kind of running up and doing their little twenty yard little routes and and finding holes in the defense. Um, but we're talking about good players. I mean, Amari Cooper. I mean, come on, like if you can't gain chemistry with him, uh, you know, in a in a relatively quickly quick time period. Then something's wrong. He's he's just too good. Yeah, he yeah. he's he gets open in time, and it, it it makes your job a lot easier. That's for sure. Your touchdown pass to Jerome Ford against the Jets was something that 
I'm not saying that nobody thought you had that in you, but when you started running to your left, did you think right then that you were just going to try to get three or four yards and yeah. and that was it? And what happened? Yeah, I thought I was going to be able to run for the first at some point. You know, I, I felt like, okay, I, I just got hit, move. Oh, I got a lot of room over here. Let's go. And then Jerome did a great job. As soon as I moved, when you watch the film, as soon as I moved, he went. And he just got in my vision. And the one thing I was worried about is like, oh, my gosh, was I passed the line of scrimmage there? I yeah. didn't think I was. I didn't think I was. But every now and then you have that thought. And I looked immediately over to the sideline and I saw the first down marker. And I was like, okay, yeah, I was behind it. But, yeah, that was a cool play. An awesome job by him to get in the end zone. That makes it that much more special. He's – look, I say this about your team. You, you know, there are a lot of people who have contributed to this team being where it is. But Andrew Barry's got to get some credit, too, because – that roster is a good and deep roster. Nobody heard of Jerome Ford on Labor Day, uh, you know, Labor last Labor Day. But that guy, he is an NFL running back right there. No, I I completely agree, man. And listen, this organization has been great. And I mean, listen, he brought me in. Uh, he was willing to give me a chance. So, like, you know, I, I was watching these guys at home and and you know, you, you lose Nick Chubb. I mean, that's a big deal. That dude, that dude is the real deal. And then for them to continue to be able to run the ball, they have, you know, the way we have most of the year has just been incredible. And it, a lot goes, it, you know, all those guys, it, it, Andrew, everybody else. It's awesome. Last thing I would ask you is, and it really is curious to me, you're a kind of a child of the East and you've lived on the East coast and then you played at Delaware, you played for the Ravens, and obviously you know the Baltimore-Cleveland thing. Of all the teams you could have gone to, how weird is it that you went to the team that, I mean, there are people who grow up in Cleveland who will hate the Ravens just irrationally yeah. for the rest of their lives, and now you were on that team. You were Baltimore's quarterback come to save their season. Is that kind of weird? It's definitely a little strange, you know. Um, it just it just shows you though, like I mean, football is football, man, and and people like to see good football. So if you can give that to them in any way, um, then they're going to enjoy it. You could this this city is unbelievable. Um, you know, it, it it's you can tell they're hungry for some good football, and they've been nothing but just. You know, like I said, unbelievable since I've been here. And you, you can just feel it, man. The stadium last night was was electric. It was an unbelievable environment. And that goes to those that goes to all all the fans that were at the game, all this whole city. It was it was it was incredible. I bet deep down you'd love to go to M M T Bank Stadium for a playoff game, wouldn't you? Oh my gosh. Listen, I, you know, I, I don't really have any preferences, uh, to be honest with you. Those guys are a really good football team. Uh, so yeah. you got to be, you got to be careful what you're asking for with that. Um, but <laughs> you, 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 you know, um, it, it's crazy how things work out. And like I said, we're just trying to stay in the moment here. And, you know, we're, we're going to say it and probably until we're blue in the face, uh, take it week by week. But that's what we're doing. And I think that's, uh, you know, credit to Kevin once again. Joe Flacco, one of the great stories in sports. I, I I think it's been so much fun to watch you, and I'm sure it's fun to be you right now. So congratulations on everything that's happened so far. Yeah, I appreciate it, Peter. Back on the podcast with my good friend, Miles Simmons. So, Miles, let's piggyback on Joe Flacco right now. And... Let's just talk about, and look, this is going to be right up your alley because you grew up in the dog pound for, for, for crying out loud. <laughs> I wonder, take your, take your dog ears off just for a second and tell me, how dangerous do you think the Browns are in these playoffs? Well, it, it's hard to take those dog ears off because when I was in the womb, <laughs> I was in the dog pile. That's my mom went to Brown's games when she was pregnant with me. So <laughs> that's how much that is in my blood. Right. But it's interesting. I mean, the, the Browns have an elite defense. They do. And I think one of the things that they've got to do is get themselves healthy. Denzel Ward has been playing you know, limited snaps 
over the last few weeks. And if he can get right with a little bit of rest this week, which I think we have to anticipate the Browns are going to rest their starters against Cincinnati. This game doesn't really mean anything for them. They are locked in as the five seed. I'd put Flacco, Denzel Ward, probably Miles Garrett, all those dudes in bubble wrap and just say, hey, let's get ourselves ready for the postseason. But that to me is where, look, you can go on the road and beat teams because you have an elite defense and you have a very experienced quarterback. Now, the one thing that Joe Flacco has done that I think could be really detrimental to the Browns in the playoffs is turn the ball over. There's just, there've been too many turnover worthy plays. And that is something that the Browns have struggled with all season long. If they didn't have any turnovers, my gosh, my, how, how much better could this offense have been? But you know, when you have Flacco, you have Amari Cooper, another guy who needs to get healthy because he didn't play on Thursday. You have somebody like Elijah Moore who seems to be doing better and hopefully he makes that out of the concussion protocol. The joke who's been playing at an elite level. There's reason to believe that the Browns can go on the road and not just win one playoff game, but win another, right? Everybody talks about when you go on the road in the playoffs, pack your defense, pack your run game. We'll see how well they can run the ball. But because Flacco is so experienced, He can throw them out of those heavy boxes. And that's what I think he's been showing over the last few weeks. And I thought it was interesting, Peter, that on Thursday night, the Jets looked a little bit more keyed up to stop the pass than they were the run, which I wouldn't necessarily expect that because Stoflacco is coming off the street. I mean, this is what his fourth, fifth game. So it's going to be interesting to see the way teams approach the Browns in the postseason, whether it's the Jaguars, you know, the Colts, the Texans, whoever, as you mentioned earlier, they beat all those teams, right? The Browns are AFC South champions if they're not the AFC North champs. So we'll, we'll see how all that turns out. But I do think this is a dangerous team in the postseason. Miles, a quick aside, and by the way, you're right. Joe Flacco in five games with the Browns has turned it over nine times. You turn it over twice in a playoff game, you're probably going to lose. Yeah. You know, who knows if you're, Defense turns over the opposition, you never know, but that's not a recipe for getting to the Super Bowl. One other thing about the Browns. You know, I had an item in my column, uh, Football Morning in America this week, uh, a chart about Deshaun Watson's 12 games since coming to the Browns and Joe Flacco's five games since coming to the Browns. Uh, Flacco's got a slightly better completion rate Uh, He's plus five touchdowns to interception margin. And Deshaun Watson is plus five with 14 touchdowns in 12, in 13 games, 12 games, excuse me. So 14 touchdowns in 12 games. Flacco, 13 touchdowns in five games. And by the way, Deshaun Watson's made 93 million over that period of time. Flacco's made 800,000. So that falls into the old Laura King, I'm just saying category um, that I got used to hearing, dad, I'm just saying every day when Laura was growing up in Montclair, New Jersey. Okay, let's move on to two other things that interest me a lot. Miles, suppose I gave you the field, the playoff field for the Baltimore Ravens. I want you to pick a team, then I'll pick one, that you think right now is going to be the most dangerous one for the Ravens on their way to Super Bowl 58. Well, I I would say it's a team we're just talking about in the Cleveland Browns. I mean, you look at the rest of the playoff field, those are teams that Baltimore has kind of vanquished, right? And and there's always going to be something dangerous when Patrick Mahomes is in the playoffs, but you know, if his receivers can't catch the darn ball, then that's going to be a problem. But the Browns went to Baltimore and beat Baltimore in Baltimore. And how many teams have we seen the Ravens completely embarrassed at home? And now, you know, obviously it'd be a different quarterback as we were just talking about Sean Watson was the quarterback who went to Baltimore and won there for the Browns earlier on in this season. But I mean, look, Joe Flacco, is anybody going to be more comfortable stepping into that stadium than Joe Flacco after he was there for a very, very, very long time and won a ton of games there? And I'm sure that would be a very weird experience for John Harbaugh going up against his former franchise quarterback. But yeah, I think 
with the way the Browns know who the Ravens are and with the way that Joe Flacco has really good postseason experience, I think they're probably the most dangerous team. And look, we could see that matchup in the divisional round. If it so happens that the Browns win and no other lower seed wins, that would be the divisional round matchup. And man, that, Peter, that'd be fun. I think it'd be great fun. My choice would be the Buffalo Bills uh, because I think right now the Bills have so much big game experience and would be so uncowed. Un, they're not going to have a problem with having to go into Baltimore. I, and that plus the fact that I just don't think home field advantage in football is that big a deal anymore. I realize, I guess the odds makers still give you three points at home, but I I don't even know if that's, I mean, Miles, I guess I would ask this question. I should know this, but what was the record of home teams versus road teams this year, last year, the previous year? It seems like it's right around 500 now. So, yeah. so anyway, first of all, that for Buffalo. Secondly, I think, Buffalo, which always, uh, you know, plays a competitive game with New England. I think Buffalo has played so well down the stretch of this season, you almost forget when they were wayward souls, you know, right. in midseason. So I would pick Buffalo as that team. But I totally agree with you on Cleveland. That Browns defense, especially if Denzel Ward can be close to 100%, for the playoffs is a really big handful to take. All right, we're going to go to the NFC and ask the same question. What team is going to be the toughest team for the 49ers to survive uh, to get to the Super Bowl? I'll go first on this one, and I'm going to steal your team because I know that you would say the Rams. And so... That's why I arranged it this way, so that I could have the Rams, Miles. And now you have to put your thinking cap on and pick somebody else. But I'll tell you this about the Rams. And look, they may not even get to San Francisco for a playoff game. But let's just say that the Rams survive the wild card game, which is a heck of a task if it's Rams at Detroit, as I don't know if they're surviving that. But if they do, I'll tell you why I think the Rams really would put the seed of doubt in the Niners' minds. And that's because, A, Matthew Stafford is a great, at this point in his life, a great big game quarterback. Yeah. You saw it in the Super Bowl. You saw it in that playoff run for the Rams. The second thing, though, I don't think we appreciate enough. If and, and look, I had it on in the background, so I didn't see it all. But I look at the Rams right now, and they, e e even though everybody would say, well, you know, Cooper Cup's playing, they're going to be fine. They got a good back in Kyron Williams. In my opinion, their most dangerous offensive player right now is Puka Nakua. And it's crazy to say that about the whatever he is, the 177th pick in the draft, week after week after week after week, teams are accounting for him, they're covering him, they're pointing to him, and it just doesn't matter because this guy has that competitive gene. And he is big trouble right now. And look, I'm not going to sit here and say that the Rams' skill players are better than the Niners, the Niners have the best uh, best team of skill players in the NFL. I don't think there's any doubt. But I think the Rams on a given day, and it's not going to be this Sunday, because I doubt either team is going to play this game like anything other than, I'm not saying a third preseason game, but I think you'll see a lot of players from the bench to start that game. I, I, but I think if the Rams get to San Francisco, it's going to be a tough game for the Niners. Yeah, Peter, this is a weird game because the Rams are in, and you know we'll see if, if they are the five, the, the six, or the seven. But I mean, at a certain point, doesn't matter. I don't know. 
I mean, if I'm the Rams, I don't necessarily want to go back to Dallas um, for an opening game. I would rather go to Detroit if for no other reason than, look, you you didn't play Detroit there this year yet. So, you know, and, you know, Stafford going back there and all that, like, again, it's the comfort factor. Um, but I don't, other than them, in terms of San Francisco, like if, even the Rams, though, they, you know, Peter, I last, my last season working for the Rams was 2018. Okay, that's a long time ago at this point. The Rams have not beaten the 49ers in the regular season since then. Okay, that's a lot of games. And the only game that they've beaten San Francisco was the NFC Championship game a couple years ago. So that's a tough matchup for them. And so we'll see what that would entail. Um, but I, I would guess that it would be Detroit that might give San Francisco the most trouble because it's not going to be the Eagles. We, it's not going to be Dallas. I think we already know that. But Detroit's not played the 49ers in that kind of situation. And so maybe it's a situation where, you know, you kind of don't know what you don't know. And you're almost playing with house money, right? You go in there and you're saying to yourselves, hey, we've got a chance to beat them because why not us? You know, and I think that that attitude could make yeah. it a little bit different. And I, and I love the way Dan Campbell gets his guys ready to play. I mean, they you, you week in and week out, you see that they are usually ready to play. So that that to me might be where you know, they could give San Francisco the most trouble. But having said that, I don't really expect San Francisco to have all that much trouble getting out of the NFC. I, I really don't. I kind of don't either, especially if Dallas is involved, because I think that they're just yeah. better than Dallas. <clears throat> and look, the one thing I would say, I don't remember a team that needs the week off more than I've seen the Niners need a week off first of all christian mccaffrey calf strain uh, he needs 20 days off which incredibly conveniently he's gonna get 20 mm -hmm. days off trent williams 20 days off yeah. i mean i assume he's not gonna play i mean if trent williams and uh christian mccaffrey right now basically have a double buy Man, is that healthy for them. Okay. Huge. One more thing. Miles, tell me. I, I've got some strong feelings. Let me, I, I, I'll start this off on Justin Fields. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think even though I do believe Justin Fields is flawed, I think right now when I look at what is happening in the, Chicago Bears organization in the NFC North and with the future of their draft position, if I were the Bears, I would bypass a quarterback in this draft and do one of two things. Trade down to, let's say, number three, let's just say, or maybe number four, but probably no lower than three. Trade down to number three and get an extra one from somebody who's willing to trade their 2024 one, um, whoever is going to have the third pick. And then you trade down to number three. Three jumps up to one to get the quarterback. Trade down to number three and take Marvin Harrison Jr., or trade down to number 12 and you get three ones. You get the 12th pick in the draft. You get next year's one and you either get two twos or, uh, or a, you know, the next year's one, because you will be able to trade two drafts out, um, you know, once you get to the postseason. So they could get a team's next two first round draft picks as well as a pick 10, 12, 13, whatever. I would rather do that for a very simple reason. I think the Bears, so often what we do is we look at quarterbacks as the nirvana for teams that are rebuilding. The only problem I have with doing that right now is that <clears throat> there aren't many teams that have been in as unique a position as the Chicago Bears. They pick number one in this year's draft, in the 24 draft, 
and they already have a guy at quarterback who their fans are chanting for. Their fans want to keep Justin Fields. I think most do, or at least a majority of them do. And they want to use this draft and next year's draft and maybe even <coughs> the 26th draft to build the team around Justin Fields. So that's what I would do. What say you, Miles Simmons? I would not do that. And the reason is you have a number one overall pick and there are, you know, quarterbacks out there that you can say it may or may not be generational, right? So I think it's incumbent upon Ryan Poles right now and the rest of that front office and the scouting department and whoever else to do as much research as you can possibly do between now and whatever day the draft is going to be held to say, all right, is Justin Fields our best option going forward or, and not just for next year, but for the, you know, however long, long term, right? Or do we reset the clock and go with Caleb Williams or Drake May or whoever else? And a, why is because it's almost a business decision more than it is a quarterback and belief in Justin Fields and all of this decision, right? I mean, this is a regime that did not pick Justin Fields and Fields has played better but he's not been great. And at this point, when you're going into a quarterback's fourth year, not only do you have to make the decision on the fifth year option, but basically you're going to be eventually saying, look, we're either going to pay him or we're not going to pay him. And if you're not convinced that you are going to pay Justin Fields, then I think you need to cut the cord and you need to say, let's restart that clock on trying to figure out and on trying to pay a quarterback with somebody who is younger and then we build that team around them because, hey, you're probably you're too good to be picking at number one overall again. Right. So this is something where because you have this extra bonus number one overall pick because of what you did last year, you now have to say, well, we're not going to be in this position again. And if we pass on Caleb Williams or Drake May or whoever else and they become elite and we still have Justin Fields and then we paid him and he's not. Like, what did we do? I think that there's an element of the known to Justin Fields where you say he may be very, very good, but he's not convinced us that we need to pay him yet. So if that's the case, then thank you very much, Justin Fields. We appreciate your contributions, but because we have this number one overall pick here and it's extra, we're going to use that and we're going to pick our next quarterback and we're going to ship you off somewhere, maybe Las Vegas, Atlanta. I don't know, get a three, perhaps a low two, We'll see, but that's the way I'd approach it. If for no other reason, than if you keep Justin Fields, you have to pay him. And based on what I've seen, I'm not sure I would want to do that yet. Who says you have to pay him? He's under team control, potentially, for two more years. You don't have and to franchise. pay him. You know, you what, you could, what you could do, what you could do very simply is you could say to Justin Fields, Let's be honest, both sides. We're not positive, and we can do something in this draft. And Miles, keep, keep this in mind, okay? If they do trade down and get two additional ones beyond this year, beyond the 24 draft, think about that for a second. That would mean that, and let's just say, we're, we're, I'm going to approximate this right now. Let's just say right now that you have this year, let's say picks 10 and 13, let's just say, in this year's draft because you've got your own pick. So let's just say you're picking 10th and 13th. And then each of the next two years, each one, each of the next two years, you have two ones. So who's to say you'll never be in this position again? And who's to say that there aren't going to be really good quarterbacks from here on out? And by the way, by the way, who's to say that with the 13th pick in the draft this year, you don't take Michael Penix, Bo Nix? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't study these guys. But it looks like there's going to be five quarterbacks that are going to generate first-round buzz. So to think that one of them, if you, if you really, really love him and is there at 13, you could just pick him put them on the team, and let the best quarterback win. Now, is that the best thing necessarily for Justin Fields' psyche? No. 
So maybe you don't even consider that. But I think overall, there's this feeling out there, and I've read it a few places. Well, if you keep fields this year, beyond this year, you got to pay them. Maybe, but I don't think you have to pay them a drop dead amount of money. I don't think you have to make the mistake that the Giants made with Daniel Jones and pay him 40 million. I think what you have to do is you got to give him a sweetener this year. You got to exercise the fifth year option, give him a sweetener and be willing, be willing after year four or at the trading deadline of year four to either trade Justin Fields or to get rid of him at the end of year four and just take the bite on that uh, on the fifth year uh, on the fifth year salary that would be killing you on the cap, but I'd be willing to do it. And Miles, look, I think the last thing I'd say about Fields is that he's not made this a no doubter. But I guess I look at the fact that everybody, when they think about quarterbacks in the draft, they get all goo goo eyed. And they say, oh my God, Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams, can't miss guy. Drake May, can't miss guy. Well, Miles, the fact is that about 40% of the picks at the very top of the draft at the quarterback position miss. So that's why I would just say, and again, I don't mean to be down on Caleb Williams. All I know is that he had a crummy senior last year at USC. And he's going to come into the NFL with some legitimate question marks. And what happens to all young high pick quarterbacks early in their NFL career? They get chased all over the field. Look at poor Bryce Young this year. How, how can people tell whether he's any good or not? You know, he's got to play a track meet every game because he's got to just run every game. So Look what happened to Caleb Williams when he played Notre Dame. He got chased all over the place and he was awful. So I think Caleb Williams is obviously is a good quarterback, good prospect. But I'm just saying, be careful what you wish for when you look at the top pick in the draft as the answer to all your problems. I, and and I, I think you, you have a point there. And it, that's why I'm saying like it's incumbent on Ryan Poles and the rest of his staff to think about this. Okay, you've got to figure this out. Is this the 2020 draft class at quarterback or is this 2021, right? Because if it's 2020, then you need to pick that quarterback. I, I'm sorry. I, that Because look, that Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Tua Tungavailoa, all very, very good players that were picked at the top of that draft. If it's 2021 and it's Trevor Lawrence, where we still got questions, it's Zach Wilson, who's awful, and it's Trey Lance, who got traded, I, then – that's not the quarterback that you need to replace him with. Right. And that's also Justin Fields draft class too. So that's where I'm saying like, look, you have a big decision to make. And if you don't anticipate being here at the top of the draft, whether you're not, you get extra picks and you can move around and that, that, that. And we saw that Houston did that with the two and then going up to get the three and you know being aggressive and getting a guy like Will Anderson, who's also been really good this year. I, I, I just think that from the team construction standpoint, if you can get that guy in, that can be a transformational guy. Like Joe Burrow transformed the Cincinnati Bengals. If you're convinced yep. that that's the guy that you can get at number one overall, you pick him because that guy does not come out in every single draft class. And then you have to surround uh, him with talent. All right? You can't, you can't have a crappy left that I would That, that I would totally agree pick. with. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you on that. Um, but... It ha that's that's the only way I would waive what I'm saying. Sure. That if you're convinced this guy is Burrow, that that this guy you know is Mahomes or whatever, if if you are convinced and you want to stake your professional career on it, that I then all bets are off with what I've said. But I guess I just look at this and I just say, and again, I don't watch much college football <laughs> but i i don't watch my, it'd be dumb for me to say so i wouldn't take caleb williams but right. in my head i don't see caleb williams as joe burrow but anyway sure. miles listen but, well, thanks Peter, so much here, for one, everything let me get, let me get one more thing yeah, in there go one more. Let me get one more thing in there i don't think it's just 
I don't think it's just the play on the field too. When I talk about that, right. It's the attitude. It's can this guy be a quarterback and be the leader of men? And that's why I'm saying you've got to study this stuff. Right. And I, I just like you, I don't, I don't study that. I watch play of college, but I don't have all the access to all the stuff with the scout staff behind the scenes, you know, where they're going and they're talking to people that have known this guy all of their lives. That's where I'm saying the research has to come in and the research can't just be, Oh, he's a great player on the field. It's what does he do off the field? How does he study in the building? How does he lead? Those are all the things that encompass being a franchise you know, guy that can turn things around really, really quickly. So that's what I would say. And if that's what you're convinced that, then that's why you pick him at number one. Miles Simmons, thanks so much for everything this week. Um, I like when we get into it a little bit. Um, let us enjoy week 18 and let us come back after week 18. And Miles, I've got a homework assignment for you. Oh I want you, when we do the podcast next week, to have your postseason award winners ready. Because we are going to go back and forth, all of them, next week. Plus, Let's do it. you and I are both going to pick our Super Bowl teams. So that's what to look forward to. And I, I, no one's going to be able to sleep now because they're going to be awake for the next six days, all just saying, oh my God, who does Peter have as his defensive player of the year? And what about Miles for his comeback player? Anyway, that is what awaits everyone in the free world on the next episode of the Peter King Podcast. Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.